to talk now about something that is uh, perpetually exciting to my students here at the university. Uh, about every year I have an opportunity to teach a course called Secret Societies in American Culture. And I found out how thrilled they are uh, to talk about Freemasons and all the conspiracy theories that have surrounded them over the centuries. Often what they find is that the history is very different from the conspiracy theories, uh, but hopefully I think they find that the history is no less interesting. Uh, the somewhat still hazy origins of Freemasons in 16th and 17th century stonemasons guilds um, are a backdrop to a pretty understandable and historically specific uh, um, history of, of Freemasons since 1717. Um, it's, in that, it's in that year that they organized the first Grand Lodge. And in, uh, in 1717 in London, four uh, individual lodges came together, organized a Grand Lodge, and began what we can now describe as organized Freemasonry, or the history of, of English Freemasonry. Uh, although it does have hazy origins in the past, and it's, it's, there's no denying that, in fact, the, there were Masonic traditions that predates uh, the, the 1717 organization of Masonry, uh, as we understand it today. But these lodges of Freemasons have long appealed to these mythical origins and ancient traditions, even while they've instilled habits of self-discipline, sociability that were suited to life in the modern world. Um, men have joined, taken oaths of secrecy, uh, and participated in often elaborate rituals, many set in and around Solomon's Temple, that's often the key point of focus for Masonic initiation rituals, that were intended to teach precepts of real utility in their own time. The regalia, the strange symbols, the, the dogma, the pompous titles seem odd to outsiders, but from Freemasons they undergird what is to them a coherent philosophy of self-improvement, of social consciousness, of charity that they insist is largely unchanged time out of mind. But this history of Freemasonry beginning in 1717 to, uh, can appear to historians working with the benefit of hindsight, and that's uh, the great advantage of, of, of historical research, is that we can see that in fact, this history of Freemasonry played some kind of role, and that's as specific as I will be, played some kind of role in the fostering of the ideals, practices, and philosophical outlooks that found their fullest expression in the age of revolution, that is in the American and the French revolutions. Uh, and I'll develop that point uh, today by talking a bit about some of the uh, principles and some of the experiences of Freemasonry that certainly played a role in the shaping of an American constitutional tradition. Precisely what that role is is still uh, something that, that uh, can be explored and examined uh, because it's very unspecific and very uh, interesting and very hazy in certain ways. In the American context, there are obvious overlaps. There are factual overlaps. Nearly half of the generals of the Continental Army that fought alongside Freemason George Washington, were Masons themselves. In 1773, the Boston Tea Party was, uh, uh, began at the Green Dragon Tavern. And at that night, the Patriot Sons of Liberty, as they were dressing up as Indians to dump tea in the harbor, uh, also met alongside the Lodge of St. Andrew, a Freemason's Lodge. And there was overlap even on the two groups. Uh, only nine of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. But the numbers go way up when you look to the Constitution. It was 13 out of 39 signers, a full third. And we know that masonry resonated with the post-revolutionary American political culture. Uh, for by 1825, more lodges met in the United States than met in the entire world in 1775, including something like 5% of all eligible males, uh, which is a, a pretty astonishing number. 5% of all eligible adult males in the United States were Freemasons uh, in 1825. Now, I'm not going to suggest anything like a cause-effect relationship with Freemasonry, and believe me, I won't suggest anything conspiratorial or a behind-the-scenes sort of hidden power role for Freemasonry. Uh, National Treasure, the movie, uh, does a great job of, of, of spinning some wild tales. Uh, but there's no evidence for anything like that at all. But in fact, there are some characteristics of Freemasonry that may have, in some way or another, played an influential role in the development of the American constitutional tradition. So beginning with that organization of the First Grand Lodge in 1717, uh, we notice historically that the people that join the Freemasons Lodge and are drawing up their first rules and codes of conduct in 1717, again, with, with origins that, that date back a century or two earlier for sure, uh, many of them were Whigs. That is, they were of the political party that not long ago had uh, dismissed the uh, potentially despotic James II and initiated the Glorious Revolution. 
We know the political persuasion of these early Freemasons, and we, we see that, in fact, this had consequences. Because the first characteristic that I'll point out about Freemasonry that has real echoes with the kinds of Republican governments that were created later in the 18th century is that it was more or less egalitarian. It had hierarchy, to be sure. There were grand masters and there were ordinary members. There were grand lodges and there were ordinary lodges, blue lodges as they were often called. Uh, but it emphasized equality. It had requirements for membership. Um, you had to be an adult male of good morals, abiding by the law, and you had to believe in God. Uh, but social status was not one of the requirements. Uh, and ultimately, what was emphasized was the equality of the members, not any kind of hierarchy. They were brothers, not fathers and sons. The bonds were horizontal, not vertical. And it's in these first Masonic texts that are being drawn up in the early part of the 18th century that you find things such as the prohibition on discussing politics in the Lodge, prohibition on discussing religion in the Lodge, even in Catholic countries. Lodge ceremonies uh, on the continent, on the European continent, rarely contained overtly Christian language and certainly kept out any reference to a Catholic church. Uh, when they do talk about religion, it's often with the most vague terms, the kind of terms actually that you wind up hearing in the early United States as well. Um, such as the grand architect of the universe. Uh, as Margaret Jacob has written, a, a wonderful historian of Freemasonry who works at the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, especially on the European continent, uh, the English origins and the Whiggish origins of uh, Freemasonry appealed to the ordinary people, the uprooted, the mercantile classes, people who weren't uh, um, genteel uh, in, the, in their own right, and they uh, they joined Freemasonry with abandon uh, beca precisely because it seemed so progressive, so egalitarian. It was democratic in its ethos, she, she, she writes, and associated with the most advanced form of European government to be found across the channel. The British government was a model of advanced, progressive, relatively egalitarian governments for uh, people looking from uh, across the English Channel. And in British North America, we see, we see a similar thing. We see people like Ben Franklin joining quite young in their life as a way of uh, finding entree into the, the, the social um, uh, classes that he wanted to interact with, to learn more from, to make business connections with. But it's this egalitarian ethos, this egalitarian uh, understanding of what Freemasonry uh, offered to the potential members that had real um, echoes later in the 18th century as they're creating a state that also emphasizes horizontal bonds and not vertical ones. A second thing I'll point out is that masonry from the very beginning always had a distinction between fundamental law and ordinary practices, ordinary rules. It's in the 18th century that we begin to hear about the landmarks of Freemasonry, a term that they often used uh, to describe those fundamental precepts of universal Masonic validity, as actually a 20th century legal scholar who studied Masonry, uh, Roscoe Pound, uh, des described the landmarks. Fundamental precepts of universal Masonic validity binding on Masons and Masonic organizations everywhere and at all times. This is uh, a set of more or less uh, uh, defined landmarks, defined basic constitutional principles of Freemasonry. Um, people actually do still debate over what qualifies as a landmark and what doesn't for those people who are debating Masonic uh, legal issues today. Uh, but that, that idea that there are certain core principles to which you must adhere if you are a Freemason uh, is indeed distinctly constitutional in the American sense that there is a supreme law and all uh, other laws of the land must adhere to that supreme law. Uh, there's something distinctly constitutional in the conduct of Freemasonry from the beginning. The very term constitution was introduced to much of the world via the exportation of Freemasonry, uh, surprisingly enough. The first time the word constitution appears in French in a political context, that is not talking about the constitution of the human body, uh, is in a Masonic context in 1710. Uh, James Anderson was a Scottish uh, uh, Presbyterian minister who drew up the first text, uh, the central text for uh, um, uh, Freemasons called The Constitutions of the Freemasons. And it was also the first Masonic book printed in the United States by Ben Franklin in, 17, in 1734 in Philadelphia. And Anderson's texts uh, and others that are coming out in the early to mid 18th century emphasize these certain irrevocable features of what Freemasonry could and should look like. From a very early date, with the formation of that first Grand Lodge in 1770, Masons were articulate, not always consistent, but articulate about these kinds of constitutional matters. A third thing I'll point out that Masonry has in common with the kinds of Republican governments that were established in the age of revolution is that it united men by symbols and principles, not 
by a commitment to obey the rule of another person or to adhere uh, to any kind of, of um, obligatory, duty-bound relationship. Men were united by images like the square and the compass, by principles like justice and charity, and not by a, um, any kind of vertical uh, a relationship. This certainly describes our American system as well, right? Our public officials take an oath to support the Constitution, not to support uh, or not to uh, obey the, the rules of any other individual. They don't even take an oath to, to uh, the American people as a whole, as would be the case in revolutionary France. They take an oath to support the document. And we too in the United States are united not by bonds um, uh, of blood or heritage, but by commitments to shared principles. And, and Freemasons have this as well. And Masonry, and this is where it becomes quite uh, intimately intertwined with the American tradition, helped to provide a lot of this shared principles and, and symbols that, we've, that we see in the early years of the Republic. Um, it becomes an important part of what we call America's civic religion. Uh, there are cornerstone la laying ceremonies, like the cornerstone laying ceremony of the Capitol in 1793, which George Washington presided over with Masonic apron. Uh, there are, um, in fact, architecture and furniture styles that dominate the 1780s and 90s that uh, are neoclassical and certainly not Masonic in origin, but are shared with the Freemasons imagery. We also see a fourth point that I want to bring out uh, is an important element of Freemasonry is that it helped instill democratic habits. These are not just egalitarian organizations uh, where everyone hangs out and drinks, although that was part of it uh, up through uh, the 19th century, uh, but they would also vote. They would also debate. They would also listen to one another. They, and did, they did all of these things, ideally, uh, with civility and in an orderly fashion. Uh, again, I'll, I'll mention something that Margaret Jacob has noted. Everywhere they spread, as she's writing about uh, the spread of masonry from England around the European continent and into the New World, everywhere they spread, the lodges denoted relative affluence, drinking, and merrymaking. But despite their cons conspicuous consumption, the lodges were also places that sought to instill decorum, at least before dinner putting a priority on discipline and manners. And it, you see it time and again, if you look at the, at the history of masonry in the 18th century, uh, they would vote. They would abide by the results of that vote. Uh, they would sit and listen quietly uh, in debate, more often than not. And these are important characteristics of a self-governing people, and they're not something that happened just by accident. People have to learn these things um, and how to engage in orderly and, and um, civil debate. One of the key aspects of this um, of, of Freemasonry then is providing a space where people can practice these kinds of habits of self-government. Another thing I'll mention, a uh, fifth thing, I believe, I believe I'm on my fifth thing, uh, is legalism uh, over mere friendship or brotherhood. Uh, the Masons were in fact quite good at creating legal regimes where if someone was expelled, they would have a procedure by which they could appeal that process. Uh, if someone was uh, suspended, they could uh, appeal their suspension uh, to a larger uh, body, uh, such as the Grand Lodge of the state in which they happen to reside. You see this time and again in Masonic records, uh, such as in the Grand Lodge of Virginia in, in October of 1792, when uh, Robert Borland appealed his expulsion from a lodge. And the, the Grand Lodge heard both sides of the case. They heard evidence, they heard testimony, and they ultimately resolved that, quote, Brother Robert Borland's expulsion from Lodge Number 16 was not only irregular, but highly unjustifiable, and that he be immediately reinstated in the privileges of masonry. Over the years, in 1790s and into the 1800s, uh, the Grand Lodge of Virginia would refine these appellate processes so that uh, people could be sure that if they were expelled or there was a contested election in their local lodge, that they could appeal it to a higher authority. Masonry, again, is helping to instill some of these habits, some of these basic practices of self-government. Masonry has so many shared characteristics with the world of the early, very early United States, the first years and decades of the, of the uh, United States. Uh, we see it on the back of the dollar bill, which has the great seal of the United States. Um, these are symbols that had meaning for Freemasons, no doubt. They're not Masonic in origin. They're simply shared uh, by uh, Freemasons and people, uh, and people influenced by the Enlightenment at the time. Uh, this, these uh, images like the pyramid with the all-seeing eye uh, 
are not Masonic, uh, not derived from Freemasonry, but had resonances both for Freemasons and for non-Freemasons at the time. And more than any kind of conspiratorial explanation, that should tell us something about the overlap between Freemasonry and a post-revolutionary American political culture. To close, I want to mention George Washington. Uh, he was a Freemason through and through. Um, he took the oath of office on a Bible borrowed from the local Masonic Lodge in New York City, from St. John's Lodge Number 1. But Washington is also useful for helping us, to, from, for keeping us from taking these Masonic connections too far. Uh, he was a Mason, uh, made a Mason at, at the Lodge in Fredericksburg in 1752, um, and he made great use of his Masonic ties to help knit together the officer corps of the Continental Army. But Washington does provide a useful reality check. Uh, for 20 years, from 1755 to 1775, he never set foot in a Masonic Lodge, never gave it a second thought. And in fact, um, men like Jefferson and Adams, um, founding fathers right alongside George Washington, also never gave any mind uh, to, to Freemasonry, and yet were clearly uh, enmeshed in the same uh, culture, this the same enlightenment attention to some of these ideals that I'm talking about, particularly egalitarianism, and particularly this uh, ideas of a, of a rule of law that helps to order society. There are lessons about the skills for self-government, about the images that helped to, to unite this American nation at a time when it was uh, still freshly out of the revolution that can be found in the early history of the Masonic fraternity. One doesn't need a conspiracy to find some connection between the revolutionary principles and the principles that helped to create uh, Freemasonry, which exists today and continues uh, sharing uh, some of these same symbols and images uh, for the people today. Uh, we see that, in fact, they have great resonance uh, for the people existing in the 1770s and the 1780s, creating the American nation. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu. Thank you.